Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here tonight. And it's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robert Ballard. I can honestly say that Bob has been an inspiration to me and countless other marine biologists uh, and scientists, marine scientists, and I'm really honored to be doing the introduction this evening. Now, Bob is best known for leading the team that discovered the hydrothermal vents in the late 1970s, as well as discovering the Titanic and the Bismarck. And today, he's president of the Ocean Exploration Trust, a nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing the deep sea into classrooms and living rooms around the world. Now, given the impact that Bob has had on marine science and education, I must admit that I felt overwhelmed, if not anxious at times, by the responsibility of doing this introduction. So in such moments, I turn to one thing that I can always count on, and that's humor. So I, I was sitting here thinking, I figured I'd come up here armed with a litany of, you know, wise anecdotes about Bob's tendencies, as his staff puts it, um, and that we'd have ourselves a proverbial underwater roast, right? Right here in the Harvard Museum of Natural History. I thought I'd start by first poking fun at Bob, um, who's clearly been following in my footsteps throughout his career. <laughs> Let me explain. Bob and I both grew up in Downey, California. We were both students at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We both ended up as deep sea scientists. We're both left-handed. We both have sons named Ben. <laughs> so since Bob continuously reminds me that in fact he's younger than I am, clearly he's following in my footsteps and not vice versa. But really, as I began to review Bob's accomplishments, I was really awestruck by what Bob has done uh, over the course of his career. Among his many accomplishments, he's a distinguished military graduate in Army intelligence, a commander in the US Navy, and the recipient of the Lone Sailor Award, which is given to sea veterans who have distinguished themselves. He earned his PhD at the University of Rhode Island, was honored with the Newcomb Cleveland Award from the American Association for the Advancement of Science for Best Paper of the Year in the prestigious journal Science. He was recently inducted to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in recognition of his contributions to science and exploration, an honor that he shares with Thomas Jefferson, Albert Einstein, among others. He's received the National Geographic Society's most prestigious award, the Hubbard Medal, for his role in exploring our world, an honor that was also conferred upon Sir Ernest Shackleton, Admiral Byrd, and Neil Armstrong. Bob was also awarded the Explorers Club Medal, the Order of Magellan, the Livingston Medal, and the Lindbergh Award in recognition of his role in deep sea exploration, as he's conducted over 140 expeditions over his 55-year uh, career. He established the Jason Foundation for Education, an award-winning foundation that has reached more than 15 million students. Two of his books have been number one bestsellers on the New York Times and London Times book lists. He's co-produced more than 35 television specials, received numerous Emmys, an Academy Award nomination, and worked with Steven Spielberg to produce the TV series Sequest. He's also been inducted into the Connecticut Hall of Fame along with Mark Twain, Paul Newman, and Katherine Hepburn. And in 2003, he received the National Endowment of the Humanities in the Oval Office from the President of the United States. But as if that weren't enough, he holds 22 honorary doctorates. So as I think about the parallels of our lives, <laughs> thin though may, they may be, I can only hope that my efforts have a fraction of the impact that Bob's have had, for there are very few people in this world who can truly claim to have been an ambassador for science, education, and exploration. So without any further ado, let's welcome Dr. Robert Ballard. My family, my, I was actually, I'm, I'm actually quite older than Peter, actually. I was born six months after Pearl Harbor, and my father uh, took the family, put us in a car, and we drove to a place called Muroc, which later became Edwards Air Force Base. And my father flew with Chuck Yeager and uh, survived. Uh, not many of them did. He was a test flight engineer. They call him a gib, a guy in the back, and he went on. <laughs> Uh, Jaeger always tells a story. He says, you know why we have Gibbs, don't you? In case we crash, we have something to eat. My father didn't <laughs> think that was funny at all. Uh, but after that, we, uh, we moved to, to San Diego. And it was really in San Diego that I fell in love with the sea. A uh, little kid from Wichita, buried in the warm sands of, of San Diego. And I, my favorite book as a child was 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And you'll see the impact that book had on me when I take you on my ship, the Nautilus, which I now have uh, just actually just came off a six month deployment. We're a little tired. But we moved to San Diego, and my parents asked me, What do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be Captain Nemo. 
It's actually my email address, isn't it? <laughs> and my parents, you know, I'm sure they went into the other room and said, Houston, we have a problem. But uh, they did not squash. You should never stomp on a child's passion and dreams, no matter how ridiculous it may be. So my parents sort of worked with me on this. And they say, well, tell me a little bit more about Captain Nemo. I had a submarine. I had the submarine, the Nautilus. Well, a few miles from my house down in Point Loma was a submarine base. And this is in the 40s. And they took me down there, and they were coming off World War II, and I went, on my, went aboard a diesel submarine. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Das Boat. I just thought that was cool. And as Peter said, I went on to be, serve for 30 years in the United States Navy, uh, mostly in deep submergence, mostly in, in naval intelligence. And we can talk a little about that or not at the Q&A. Uh, but then they said, well, the Captain Nemo, the Nautilus was more than just a submarine. He said, yeah, a big window, a big window that opened like the iris of a lens. And you could see the bottom of the ocean. And they said, well, that sounds like an oceanographer. So sure enough, they uh, took me down to Scripps in La Jolla, or La Jolla, whatever you want to call it. But anyway, <laughs> I, and it was not close to my house, the largest oceanographic institution in the world. And I went down there, and they had a museum, and I got really thought this was cool. And in fact, I uh, got a scholarship when I was in high school. Uh, I wrote a letter. I'm dyslexic, so I'm sure I misspelled oceanographer. But anyway, we didn't have spell check back then. I had parents back then doing it. And, uh, but I got a scholarship, and I went to sea on my first oceanographic expedition when I was 15, in 1959. I was 17. And we went out, and we got hit by a rogue wave, and were rescued by the Coast Guard, and I thought that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, it was amazing. And I went on to, uh, uh, I was actually, uh, we came limping into Santa Barbara, all busted up. And I met a professor there by the name of Bob Norris, who had got his PhD at Scripps in, uh, in, uh, in marine geology. And he says, you know, we have an amazing program in Santa Barbara for marine scientists. And I applied, got there. And he was my professor. But when I walked on campus, and this is 1960, uh, mandatory ROTC, where land grant university, you walk on campus, you're in ROTC if you're a male and can walk. And so my first two years were in, in, in the Army, because they beautiful campus on the beautiful beach of, of Santa Barbara, no Navy, Army. So I, I went in the Army, and then I had a choice, not much of one, in 1962. I could go to Vietnam as a private or as an, as an infantry officer. Foolishly, I chose to become an infantry officer, but I went off to Fort Lewis and was trained. And then I went on to lay a call to active duty, which I, want, I was admitted to USC's graduate program. And so I'm knowing that I'm you know, looking at my watch and I know where I'm headed, but at least they're letting me get my doctorate. Uh, but I was getting a doctorate in oceanography. And thank God someone put the dots together and said, What's an army officer doing getting a PhD in oceanography? So one night, a knock on the door, and there's a naval officer saying, congratulations. You're no longer an army intelligence officer. You have, you're now a naval intelligence officer. <laughs> and you have six days to get to a place called the Woods Hole Oceanographic. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, I thought I was. Going to Vietnam, a combat infantry officer, uh, 90 seconds, uh, life expectancy, bullets from the back. But anyway, so I ended up arriving at the Woods Hole. It's so funny how you spend your whole life trying to plan your destiny, and this random thing happens, and it changes my life. So I drove across to my little VW, reported to Maine Navy down here in the Fargo building. First person I saluted was a chief petty officer. You know, I didn't know. He looked impressive. I, uh, <laughs> I, he didn't return my salute, I must say. And then I spent, uh, was embedded. Actually, I was a naval intelligence officer at Woods Hole. We'll talk a little bit about that journey uh, because it was an interesting journey that I was on. I'm still on it. You don't ever get out. But uh, my passion for my early career was diving in submarines. Let me see if I get the right button here. But when I was growing up, and Peter said I had to start with William Beebe and o uh, o Otis Barton and the bathosphere on non shuts Island in Bermuda, because when I, yes, yeah, you want to, they're trying to film me. They want to see the screen. There's, you want the lights lower? 
I'm actually used to working in the dark. If you can make it as dark as possible, <laughs> I, I could walk over there. Yeah, they brought it up because I think they're trying to film me. How are we doing? Am I in a bad spot? Do you need me somewhere? There we go. You're, you're yeah, make me dark. There we go. Oh, there we go. How's that? I like that a lot. Anyway, uh, so when I was growing up, National Geographic was my life, reading National, and Otis Barton and William Beebe, uh, when they made the first dives in the bathosphere, this would not be allowed. This was the most stupid thing you could ever imagine, <laughs> putting people in a, in, a, in a wrecking ball and lowering them on a cable that could break and they're toast. But they did it, and they went down 6,000 uh, 6, feet, and they, beautiful photographs of hatchet fish and lantern, I, terrifying fish, and then thank God they're only that big. You know, I thought, you know, why didn't they get like a dinosaur? But anyway, uh, and then I, I, in, when I was in high school, the Bathyscath Trieste made that historic dive into Challenger Deep, 35,800 feet down, eight tons per square inch. And that's where my life began. So I began diving in submarines. As a naval officer, I did a lot in a particular submarine that you don't know a lot about. We just opened a beautiful exhibit about it because it was classified most of the time. It was called the NR-1 the smallest nuclear submarine ever built. It's now a beautiful exhibit at the Navy Submarine Museum in Groton, New London. Go down there, it's a gorgeous exhibit on the NR-1. We just opened it a few days ago. But the NR-1 was as close as you could get to Captain Nemo's Nautilus. It, had, it could dive, they, well, we declassified it to 3,000 feet, stay underwater for a month, and it had windows, and you could, wheels, and you could drive on the bottom. It was really cool. I mean, you could drive for a month underwater, which is a lot of tater tots, a lot of TV dinners. <laughs> and then I used lots of bathyscaths, gas, the French bathyscath, gas, the, uh, the Archimede and the uh, U.S. bathyscath gas, Trieste II, which are absolutely the most dangerous things you could ever dive into. Most of my near-death experiences came in those guys, and I'm really glad they're in museums. And then finally, uh, through the modern submersible, but my favorite one was clearly Alvin. I spent uh, 25 years uh, living inside that submarine. They let me out periodically. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this is a, taken with a fisheye lens, which makes it look extremely roomy. It's, it's not. Uh, I'm 6'2", it's six feet. I used to have a lot of hair. I lost it all <laughs> on that hatch. But that was my home, away from home. We did great things. This was all through the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, the last dive I actually made in Alvin was on the Titanic in 1986. But my passion, and I think it came from watching Disney film that they did on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, when they were, uh, the Nautilus had, had, was parked on the bottom and, the, and Captain Nemo was walking on the ocean floor. I don't know if you remember that scene. And the thought that you could walk, you know, I grew up with the ocean being like that, but that they, you could actually walk on the bottom of the ocean made me a marine geologist. I became fascinated with the fact that the largest mountain ranges on our planet lie beneath the sea. The mid-ocean ridge runs around our planet like this. Wait, is it, I'll get the right button here. It's dead on me. Is that? I'm, I'm, I'm hurting here already. <laughs> This is, the, my laser beam is not working. I, had, I asked him for a Darth Vader laser beam. All right, but anyway, uh, right there. <laughs> you gotta improvise. Happens a lot in submarines when there's a fire. You have to improvise. Wait, how are we doing? Are we going? Got it now? Do you need a job? Yeah. All right. Imagine that there's this mountain range that runs around our planet like the seam in a baseball. Now, this is a Mercator projection where you take a sheet of paper and wrap it around a globe and project. So it really distorts everything in high latitude. Greenland is not that big. Antarctica isn't that big. It's pretty accurate right here. But this mountain range, if you were to put it on an equal area projection, covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area. Almost a quarter of our planet is this mountain range. And we didn't know it was there when I was in high school. And we didn't see the largest feature on our planet till after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the moon. Now think about that. We went to the moon. We played golf up there before we went to the largest single feature of our own planet. Amazing. 
And NASA's budget to explore outer space is 1,000 times larger than our program to explore our own planet. Figure that one out. We can talk about that later on. <laughs> it's nuts. Anyway, uh, but we wanted to explore this mountain range not only because it dominates the planet, for goodness sake, but because of a new theory that had come out when I was a graduate student called plate tectonics, the Rosetta Stone of unlocking all the geology of our planet. And that was that the, that the Earth was made up of a series of pieces called plates. They're called plates because they're thin like a plate. And these plates, about 23 of them, are in a beautiful ballet dancing on the surface of the Earth. And they do one of three things, and that's it. They either move away from one another, which is along that mountain range, towards one another, or neither of the above, uh, gliding past one another. And now on the mid-ocean ridge, see, the Earth is a creature. It's a living organism. And if you cut into its body, just like if you cut into your own body, your blood will come out. A liquid, warm fluid will come out of your body. It will harden, coagulate, and form new tissue. If you cut the earth, it does the same thing. If you rip open its skin, and that's what's happening here, it bleeds its molten blood. That blood rises up from the asthenosphere and heals the wound and creates new tissue. Now, since the earth isn't getting any bigger or smaller, it's in steady state. If you create new tissue on the surface of the earth, somewhere else you're consuming old tissue. And that's what's happening where the plates are in collision. The continental plate, because it's light, made of very light minerals like, like feldspar and, and, and quartz, uh, what we call uh, light silicas of, uh, of potassium, uh, sodium, aluminum, what we typically would call granite. If you took a cubic foot of granite and you put it on a waterbed, it would sink into a waterbed. But if you put a cubic foot of ocean crust made up of much heavier minerals, the ocean crust sinks deeper in the waterbed. That's why oceans are down and continents are up. It's simply their composition. So when they go at it, the ocean always loses. It's always in a position to lose. And it subducts. So, but no one had ever actually gone to the boundary of creation to actually see it firsthand until a group of us got in submarines and went down. This is, I love this, I call it the bleeding earth. That is ground zero. That's zero earth. Now, we know that the earth is about 4.5 billion years old. Wait a minute, billions of years and the oldest crust is only 280, little over a quarter of one billion. Is the ocean that young? No, it's completely, constantly recycling itself. The history of the Earth is, is in the continents because they can't subduct. So the ancient history of our planet and the shield areas of our major continents is where the ancient history of the Earth is. The ocean's constantly recycling itself. Now the reason the bands are different, the plates are moving at different speeds. The faster the plate, the wider the age belt. But you'll see the oldest ocean floor is subducting in the Hellentian Trench up here with a giant ocean that used to be called the Tethys. It was a magnificent ocean that's all been closed. Uh, when India smacked into the Himalayas, all of these continents are smacking into one another, and that's the last remnants of a great sea called the Tethys. But no one, as I said, had actually gone down and looked at it. So this is, this is a, a characterization of what's down there, but really, quite honestly, uh, let, me see if, uh, let me see if I can get a dark image. Is it this one? That's what it really looks like down there. <laughs> And that's important to know, because just as we'd thrown out our geology books with plate tectonics, all that great work done by a lot of geologists at Harvard got drop kicked into the trash can when we came out with plate tectonics and we had a mining period, beautiful data misinterpreted. A lot of us wrote papers and papers and papers and never went in the field. We just reinterpreted all of Harvard's great field observations. It was a, it was a shark frenzy of papers, so you didn't sleep because you could just get them published, published, published. But when you went down there, and this is a characterization without vertical exaggeration, this is the North American plate going that way, that's the, uh, North, uh, the, the Eurasian plate going that way, and that's the boundary of injection. That boundary of injection, despite the immensity of the plates, is actually very narrow, less than 100 meters or so. That is where the Earth is bleeding. So imagine you can get in this crack called the Rift Valley beneath the North Pole and go around the Earth, never leave it, and go for 40,000 miles. And it'll stay along the boundary of creation. 
all through the Atlantic, all through the Indian Ocean, up into Baja, finally make a left-hand turn, become the San Andreas Fault. So we were initially focused on the volcanism. And so we were really looking at, imagine, there are tens of thousands of magma chambers less than a kilometer down along that entire mountain range. And they're 14 to, 12 to 1400 degrees centigrade. You want free energy? There it is. And only Iceland is really tapping it because they live astride of it. They call it the Midgarp serpent in their legend. And they're starting to look about how they can microwave off their geothermal energy. Don't fly a plane between that transmitter and that satellite. But uh, they're talking about exporting that energy because it's, it's boundless. It's, it's, it's renewable. But then we were driving along. So we, when we, were, we initially were focusing on, on the volcanism and the creative process. But we could see that no sooner does the crust create itself, the new blood is, there's a seat right here. Oh, you got it? If anyone wants, there's a seat right here. I won't buy you the seat there. We got some seats up front. But the whole idea of this was that we were focused initially, like you always are, focused. Sometimes you miss things. But the fact that no sooner does that lithosphere form by a volcanic episode, it's being pulled apart. The plates don't stop and start. They got tremendous inertia. So they're constantly moving. So they're constantly applying tensional force on that new crust, and it starts to crack it. Now, that crack is going to migrate, migrate down till it hits the magma chamber, and then it's going to trigger it. Depends upon the speed of the plates on how fast that process occurs. But in thousands of years, maybe even hundreds of years in some areas, it's going to have another eruptive cycle. Right here and right there. And you can sit where I was sitting. Go down and we'll sit next to Peter. <laughs> and you can sit right there. Here you go. I like to fill the house. This is. So anyway. So when you start thinking about how many cracks there are on 40,000 miles of mountain range, a lot of cracks. And those cracks are going down a kilometer to hit that magma chamber. And then you realize water's following that crack. So then so we had a problem back then. We couldn't do what we call our mass balance calculations. We couldn't explain why the ocean had the chemistry that it had. It had a chemistry, but it wasn't what we thought it was because that we thought the culprit were the rivers. They're the guys bringing all the stuff in. They evaporate at pure H2O. They leave everything behind. They keep doing it, keep doing it. So if we looked at the chemistry of the, o of the rivers, they should be equal to the chemistry of the oceans. Not. Problem. Well, let's ignore it. You know, so we didn't know until we realized, wait a minute, there's water going down these cracks, it's interacting with the magma chambers, carrying those chemicals. What's it doing? And we discovered that it's going down and it's interacting with the magma chamber coming back. We found these what we call black smokers. Now that's a, I, I don't know, I, I created the term, it was really stupid, because it has nothing to do with smoke. It looks like smoke. It looks like Pittsburgh on a good day, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, have, I was just kidding. I don't say that in Pittsburgh. But anyway. But if you get really, I remember the first time we saw one. I said, let's go. I told the pilot, let's go see how hot it is. He goes, really? I said, yeah, we, let's go. I, I want to see how hot it is. So we had a thermometer. Stick the thermometer in the thing. So we go up to it, and we're, you know, we, manipulator. So we're sticking the thermometer in. And I'm looking at the gauge, and it goes, bam. It just pegs off scale. The pilot says, that's hot, OK? <laughs> we pull out the probe. The whole probe had melted. And then the pilot said, Bob, the porthole is made out of the same stuff. <laughs> and unbeknownst to us on that first day, we were burning a hole in Alvin's foam. We were sitting on another one about a few inches from that downward looking porthole. That would have been a bad day at the office. We would have lasted about a nanosecond. We wouldn't have known what hit us, and we would have been you know, fish meal. But anyway, so we looked at, but here's what a real one looks like. That's about my height. Now, here's what's interesting. You know what you're looking at? Commercial grade ore of copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. Copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold in commercial concentrations. And we're, st we're looking at mining it. And I just had a big symposium on, is that a good idea? And if you can, how do you do it? How do you not do it? But that is commercial grade ore. It's the same as the copper mines of Cyprus, which fed the Bronze Age. It's an uplifted black smoker. We didn't know that at the time. But so this is a massive amount. Now let's back up. These black smokers are being created 
along that mountain range, right? All of the colored stuff originated there. All of that colored area is full of copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. Let that sink in. I don't know if you want to buy stock in the metal market. It's going to collapse. But anyway, <laughs> th this entire area is underladen with black smokers. And they're just now a, a Canadian company and an Australian company are just bought the lease rights to uh, Papua New Guinea to begin mining these guys. And so that's a big issue. But what blew us all away was let's go back to this picture. We, because the ocean is really, uh, let's get this right, that most, the average depth of the ocean is uh, 13,000 feet. Okay, 13,000 feet. A photon from the sun cannot get to the surface. Most of the earth is in eternal darkness. Most of the earth has never felt the warmth of the sun, now will it ever. In the absence of sunlight, you can't have photosynthesis. So there's no plants growing on the ocean floor. So when we first went down there, we geologists hate plants because they cover geology. <laughs> We've been accused of for setting forest fires, which is all untrue. But we do go immediately after a forest fire to look at the geology. So if there's no life down there, there's a little from the euphotic zone. These guys are bringing it down, but not much to eat than eat about. The, 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 the creatures in the euphotic zone, the upper sunlit layers, the phytoplankton, zooplankton, as they fall, they're eaten about two or three, four times. We call it the fecal express. And, and the average rate of sedimentation in the deep sea is about a centimeter per millennium, so it's not a lot of food. So we, we accepted all of that until we're driving along, and we see that, and we go, time out. This is not fair. We're at 8,000 feet. The biomass here is, well, I don't know, three to four times the sun, the euphotic zone. Three to, even more than that, probably, order of magnitude. Up in the sunlit area, it can't compete with what's going down in total darkness. So we're going, not fair. And there was a dominated by a particular worm, a vestimentifera, that stuck its lung out. That's its lung. And it's sticking its lung out to ingest what turns out to be pretty bad stuff. It's ingesting uh, gas, uh, fluids that have hydrogen sulfide. If we filled the room with hydrogen sulfide, it's a very ugly death. Not only do we not like it, plants don't like it either, but these guys are smoking it. OK, so <laughs> what's going on? And we found these giant clams, clams that had human-like blood. Foot, not fair. When we opened that guy up, I took out a dissecting knife, expecting, I, I, we, I love clams on the half shell. I wouldn't eat this one. <laughs> if you could get, even if you could get past the smell. The smell is the smell of rotten eggs, sulfur. And I dissected it, expecting the internal anatomy of a clam. Wrong. It had bacterium that had taken over its body and figured out of eons of time how to replicate photosynthesis in the dark. Uh, we now call that chemosynthesis. So these are what we now call extremophiles. We believe these guys can survive on meteorites, and that's how planets reproduce. So those of you that have trouble being related to a monkey, try that. <laughs> <clears throat> OK, so lots of good stuff going on. But I, you know, I'm getting tired of going up and down in an elevator. It takes me two and a half hours to get to work in the morning, two and a half hours to get home at night. I got a five hour commute to work. I was as bad as coming here to, from Connecticut, rush hour. That was wonderful on the Mass Pike. That's about a typical day at the office for me. Uh, and so I said, this is crazy. I'm only spending three hours on the bottom. I'm trying to explore 72% of the planet at one knot. You know, it's not gonna work. So I went off to Stanford. 79, I was teaching geophysics there, and I said, there's got to be a better way of going to work. And this was in Silicon Valley at the time, microprocessing, fiber optics, all sorts of cool things evolving. I should have thought, make a cell phone out of it, but I didn't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we would have financed the whole thing on that. But so I came back, and I published in National Geographic a concept in 1981 called telepresence. And the whole concept is to, to have an out-of-body experience. To not, you know, our body, we live on, the human race lives on less, 95% of the human race is living on less than 5% of the planet. We live in nowhere in outer space and we're not going to get out there. And living on Mars is a bunch of baloney. Like, you got to be kidding. 
but your spirit is indestructible, can move at speed of light. Now, I don't know if many of you saw Avatar. How many saw Avatar? Okay. See it if you haven't, because it's in the movie. Remember Jake the War Veteran? They take him in a room and he's got a Navi. A Navi for those is a big eight foot blue green thing with funny ears and a tail. <laughs> Somewhat sexy, but not quite. <laughs> and Jake's in there, they take Jake in, they lay him on a slab, and they move him, his spirit, from his body into the Navi. Remember the scene? What did he do when he realized he was in the Navi? What did he do the moment he said, oh my gosh? What did he do? Remember? He got up and ran. And they thought, oh, he's freaked out. So they went and they got, you okay? He says, yeah, I'm fine. Why'd you run? And he says, because I wanted the wind in my face again. Because Jake was a war veteran paralyzed from the waist down. His body had failed him. He woke up in another body. It had legs. He didn't care. He was blue-green, eight feet tall, and had a tail. I'm running. And he ran. That's my Navi. My body is not meant to be down there. And most of our future is going to be in end effectors. Most of our future. <clears throat> I live on the Connecticut River in the wetlands. I don't want to leave it move my spirit. And so I said, how can I implement that? I want to, I want I love being at home. I love being with my wife and children, but I love to explore. Can I, can I just, pfft, at the speed of light. Speed of light, I can move from my house in Connecticut to that in a fraction of a second. And when I need to go to the bathroom, I get up and it's sort of a, oh, I'm in Connecticut. I go to the bathroom and I go back down to the bottom of the ocean. <clears throat> So I had to, I, so I came home and I, I, we have a program at Woods Hole with MIT, a bunch of bright guys and girls, and I said, hey guys, I want to take this vision and make it into a technological reality. And they thought it was nuts until I said, what physics have I violated? And they said, yeah, actually not. It'll be difficult. And I said, I got you, if it's not impossible. So then I needed someone to fund it. <clears throat> well, NSF was still excited about, and you know, I got to get my gills, get, get dried out, and I got to get some more. So NSF says, well, you know, we're, we're really excited about Alvin. I says, no, it's passe. And we want to do this. And they said, we didn't, we're, not gonna, we're gonna get an Alvin. I said, well, then, so I said, I couldn't find anyone to fund it. So being a, a Naval Intelligence Officer for 30 years, I went to the Navy. I said, what do you think? They said, it's cool. I like it. There's no humans in the battlefield. And I said, yeah, isn't that nice? We're, gonna have, we're not going to be out there. You know, it's called drones. And they say, well, how, you, how about underwater drones? They said, now you're talking. This is 1981. And so I, they said, we'll fund it. But we need you to do something for us to pay the piper. What's that? And they said, well, during the Cold War, we lost two submarines, the Thresher and the Scorpion. And in the case of the Scorpion, we lost nuclear weapons. We don't like that. So we want you to go take care of that, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna build my stuff, and uh, yeah, yeah, but don't tell anybody. You need a cover story. And I said, have I got the perfect cover story for you? <laughs> Swear to God, it's exactly how it happened. The Thresher is to the west of the Titanic, the Scorpions to the east. If that hadn't have been the fact, I would have not been the guy. So I said, what do you think? And they said, this is cool. They were pissed when I found it. <laughs> they were, they, you're nuts. I said, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. <laughs> but I did. And I went out and I did all the homework. I want to find the Titanic. But I used the Thresher and the Scorpion as a cover. But I had to do them first, so I had very little time left. So I had to analyze how you find it. How could I do it? Everyone else had months. I had days. And I went down with my first Navi, Argus. This was my first command center. This is a moment of discovery. When I show you what I have now, this looks like two cans and a string. But it's, it was good enough, because we didn't come up. And we stayed down, stayed down. We picked up the debris field, which I learned from the Thresher and Scorpion, scattered all over the place. Don't look for the ship, look for its debris. Follow the debris, and the pieces get bigger, and bam. So then the weather came in, I had to come back. And then the, the, the Navy wanted me to go inside the Scorpion and the Thresher, into the forward torpedo room, see where those, what's going cooking on in there. So I said, well, let's do it again. Let's tell the public I'm going to go into the grand staircase of the Titanic. And they said, that's cool. So I mounted on Alvin a little vehicle called, a prototype called Jason Jr. of my larger vehicle system. And sure enough, we went down, relocated the Titanic. 
That was cool. Still has anti-fouling pendant. Should have painted the whole thing in that and it would be fine. Uh, and then we landed on the deck of the Titanic. And from that, you could, you, you know, I, you know, I want to stabilize the submarine, so I land on it. Boof. And then I can deploy the vehicle system, peek in the windows of Molly Brown and all that sort of stuff. But then I needed to penetrate inside because I was going to penetrate into the forward torpedo room of the Scorpion. So we landed above the Marconi room, went down the grand staircase, and boom, proved everything. And then uh, the most compelling image was really this is what happens to people. They're eaten, their bones dissolve, and those are their tombstones. And when I saw that, I wasn't going to pick that coin up. And I then said, let's not disturb this site. I tried. I was unsuccessful. Big legal thing I can talk about. But unless I, I could own the Titanic under one condition if I removed it from the bottom of the ocean. I said, I don't want to do that. They said, well, you can't own it. I said, that's silly. 1640 Admiralty Law. Uh, but then I went on a binge. And I went after the Bismarck and I found it in 16,000 feet of water. I went after the Yorktown. People always ask me, how do you know it's the right ship? This said Yorktown on the back of it. <laughs> Uh, but then the question always comes, well, you know, scientists get on a road that can't stop themselves. Well, these are metal ships. They're less than 100 years old. Of course they're going to be there. What about the ancient mariners? How many of them have gone down? And the answer is a million. So I worked with Larry Steger here in the Semitic Museum. I said, Larry, let's go out and find some of these. So we went out and started exploring the Mediterranean. We, we started to establish that the ancient mariner did go on great long haul trade routes. So I said, let's start here, because this is Carthage, this is Rome. They, they were beat in the, in, the, in the Punic Wars and became a vassal state to Rome. They had a trade route. I don't believe they went around this way. Da -da -da, they went straight across. So I did my most sophisticated analysis. I drew a straight line between Carthage and Rome, and I said, that's how they went. <laughs> so then I said, OK, what are they going to do? Are there going to be a ship that has maybe 3,000 bottles of wine on them called Amphorus? Yeah, they're going to drink them. And then because they're not supposed to drink them, they're going to throw them overboard and say they broke. So they're going to litter. It's going to be I-95 without an adopt-a-highway program <laughs> for several millenniums. And sure enough, I started going. I went this way perpendicular, hit the, 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 the they had actually a very narrow line. It was four kilometers wide. It was thousands of, thousands of empties. They drank all the way to Rome <laughs> for multiple centuries. And then I started finding the shipwrecks. This was a, a first century BC as I discovered it. I did it off with Larry. We did one off. Of I love this one. A prefabricated temple from Home Depot was aboard one of them. <laughs> and then this was the one, the 750 BC one off Ashkelon that was in mint condition. Uh, but it's been eaten. And that's because there's, as Ruth Turner here in the Museum of Comparative Zoology did a lot of research on boring uh, uh, worms called uh, Cheritos. They eat them very, very carefully. They don't disturb a lot, but they eat them. And then I said, well, let's go to the Black Sea, because the Black Sea has no oxygen. So they can't have any Torritos. So I went into the Black I couldn't get in there during the Cold War, but as soon as the Berlin Wall came down, I don't know what you were thinking. I said, I'm going to the Black Sea. And so, because I knew the Greeks were in there. They had uh, colonies here at Sinope and had a place right near Sebastopol called Kersenesis. And I figured they had a trade route. If you went across the trade route and they had a bad day, they would fall into an anoxic environment. They should be perfectly preserved. And sure enough, I found perfectly preserved shipwrecks. This particular one is Byzantine, still has rigging on it, in mint condition. The bottom is dead as a doornail. I began excavating it with my little Hoover cleaner. This is, this is a piece of beam that's been underwater for 1,200 years in mint condition. Look at that, Carpenter's ad mark. Look at the artifact in mint condition, still has beeswax dripping. And I just recently found one from the classical period, 500 BC, that had human remains. Think about those time capsules. But what have you done for me lately? OK, where am I now? Well, after doing all of this, I said, I want to bring this up to full, full, the full Monty. And I wanted to, uh, I look back upon my career of 150 expeditions, 55 years at sea, and all the really important things were the hydrothermal vents, the black smokers, the things we did not know existed. We didn't know they were there. Kids say, what are you going to discover next? And I say, I don't think you understand the process. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to discover. It's a real tough proposal to write to the National Science Foundation and say, I don't know. I just want to go. And they go, not good enough. 
So I said, let's get crazy and let's reinvent the Challenger expedition where the community goes out there. It's not, we were gonna, we're gonna open source everything. We're gonna go to, everything's everybody in the game. It's not one PI jealously guarding their data. You know, I'm way past that. And I said, let's mount some modern day Challenger expedition. And I got my ship. I called it the Nautilus. It was an East German spy ship. Another story uh, on that one. And then I implemented my telepresence. And we're running the ship like the emergency room of a hospital. Because we don't know what we're going to find. We're going where no one has gone before on planet Earth. And so what's going to happen? We work 24-7. The ship goes to sea for six months. It just grinds. Four on, eight off watches. Come in and get some bananas and some lettuce and back out. Boom, 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 boom. Because 20,000 leagues under the sea was this way. And we, we registered almost 10,000 leagues this year. A league is, uh, well, not 10,000, 1,000 leagues. A, a league's eight, uh, what a, uh, how fast a Roman legionnaire can walk in an hour. I think it's four, th four, four miles an hour. That's a league. And so we did 10,000 miles, so run the number a couple thousand leagues. I'm going to do 20. But the idea is, so we make a discovery. First place, the ship is full of students. We have very few faculty members aboard because we, you know, we'll call you when we need you. And they're expensive and you complain a lot. Anyway, <laughs> graduate students are perfect. They're smart, cheap, and do what you say. <laughs> I love graduate students. And so the idea is, so you make a discovery. So our promise, now listen, here's the promise. We're going to go to the middle of nowhere where we've never been. No matter when we're there, Sunday morning, 2 AM, 20,000 feet down in the absolute middle of nowhere, and we make a discovery, we will deliver the brightest mind in America to that spot in 30 minutes. In 30 minutes, we'll have the brightest mind at that spot. Now, how the heck are you going to do that? Piece of cake, because we're just moving their spirit. So I implemented that whole paradigm. I have a ship that can make maps like no one can imagine. You can go in and paint your maps. This is the ship going into nowhere and making a beautiful digital map. It can not only make a bathymetric map like you see here at full speed. It can see oil and gas coming out of the bottom of the ocean. I don't know. A lot of people like finding that. We just jumped over several geophysical steps of where is it? Well, it's right there. Can't you see it? You know? And we then prosecute it with our vehicles. So this is my Navi. This carries my spirit. And it has another vehicle to come along with it called Argus, who's the eye in the sky, lights up everything so I can see where I'm down. And then this is the operating room. And you'll see it full of students, full of students. And we operate 20. That's our operating room. And we have pilots and co-pilot, Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy. Uh, Eagle Scouts, uh, girls equivalent of Eagle Scouts. We have amazing uh, number of bright people running all of our technology. And then we have a couple old farts. Now the role of the old fart is that they have to forget when they got tenure. <laughs> then they're ready. They have to not have a dog in the fight. And they have to be looking at their watch saying, you know, I don't got a lot of time. So could you accelerate discovery a little? So they have a vested interest. And it's called wisdom. And now with the aging of America and the aging of the human race, wisdom is finally coming into play where it's useful. We have what we call the village elders. And they are the ones that say, you know who really needs to be brought into play? Someone at And we have a phone here. And the ship thinks it's at the Graduate School of Oceanography. So every phone on the ship is area code 401. Uh, 874, and I'm not going to tell you the other four numbers, but anyway. <laughs> and you pick it up and you call. So you make a discovery. You say, get them on the phone. It's Sunday morning, 2 o'clock. We wake Deb Kelly, you dub. We wake up Deb. She's in her bed. And we wake her up. Hi, Deb. You're, uh, uh, sorry to wake you up. Boot up your laptop. So she's got her laptop wirelessly in her bed. And we boot it up. We stream the discovery to her in real time, one way video. We're not going to look at Deb. <laughs> we make that promise. It's bad hair day, whatever. And then we, we network her phone to the pilot. Peter did it. Peter, I got to tell Peter's story. So Peter is one of our doctors on call. We, where were we? We were somewhere. Uh, Caribbean. Caribbean. We're down in the Caribbean. We found 
We found some. What was Iron it? Oxidizers. Iron oxidizers. And Peter's on our list. So we picked up the phone. We call him Peter, Peter's cell phone. He's not answering. So we sent him a message. Peter is at 35,000 feet in jet blue. And we say, he comes on, I'm here. And he took over the operation. He then started managing the entire, while he's flying across the United States at 35,000 feet in jet blue. And he ran the whole operation until he landed. And they had to run in the airport and get on the phone again. But that's how powerful this technology is. So you just put it on that. You put it on the satellite. This is my center at the university. This is my full of students. So I got students at both ends. And then we're connected to all the experts by a new, a new internet called Internet 2 Level 3. This is going to rock, rock, and rock. This makes the internet you're on, you're on a dirt road on the information highway. <laughs> you're, you know, a little clock going around. This is 10 gigabits of bandwidth. It's like drinking information from a fire hydrant. <laughs> and we can fool your brain into thinking you're somewhere else. So we can build remote command centers. Oops, there they are. So what are we going to do with it? Well, did you, did you know that 50% of the United States is under the ocean? We own more land beneath the sea than any other country on the planet. And we have better maps of Mars than half the United States of America. We want to know what we own. So our mission is to explore the new America. And if we can prove it in a legal case, extend our claim. This is, 50, this is equal to the land mass. This gets us another 20% if we can prove our continental shelf goes beyond 200 miles, which is clearly here. That's got about a trillion dollars of oil and gas in it. Huge resources. Fisheries that we can finally manage without anyone else messing around, because we own them lock, stock, and barrel. Rare earths. Rare earths uh, are, are critical to the electronic industry. China controls 98% of the rare earths. All your computers, all your laptops, your fighter jets, everything, these rare earths, they got 90-some percent of the rare earths. But our territorial trust islands are coded with them. So finally, because I want to stay on schedule, I'm right on the button, Peter, is that's all cool. But I'm really pumped about getting the next generation into the game. I really enjoy that. And I did it with my J. When I found the Titanic, I came home, back to Woods Hole, and there were 16,000 letters from kids all across this country. I could not even see my desk. It was gone in a pile of letters. And I still get that many a, almost a day. I have a whole staff that does nothing but answer kids' letters. And the letters all said the same thing. What do I have to do to do what you do? They saw my robot as R2-D2, <laughs> but a real one. They know the difference, believe it or not. We're just playing a real video game. And they saw that, and they said, what do I have to do to do what you do? Well, I went to college and took a quadruple major in math, physics, chemistry, and geology. It's a good start. <laughs> you know, study, OK? But then they said, uh, the second sentence said, next time you go, can I go with you? And I said, you bet. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking our technology of reaching spirits, my exciting explorations that we're doing, and I'm going after kids. Now, my approach is a little different than our ed educational system in America. The United States is second only to uh, Luxembourg in how much we spend on our children for education. Luxembourg, believe it or not, spends more than us. We're number two on how much we spend on our kids. But in the Western world, we're 27th in STEM literacy. A lot of money, not getting the results. I have a thesis as to why that's. It's not about selling science and engineering. It's about selling scientists and engineers. It's all about role modeling and mentoring. So I've mandated, because I can. It's wonderful. They say the most efficient form of government is a benevolent dictator. Unfortunately, the worst form of government is a non-benevolent dictator. But anyway, as a dictator, because I created this whole thing, I mandate that 55% of my core, and I call it the core of exploration, because Lewis and Clark was the core of discovery. But it's not Lewis and Clark. It's Lois and Clark. 
I've mandated that the core will be 55% women in positions of leadership and authority running the show. And I, I'm at 48%. I'll hit 55 and probably next year. And it better have every face our nation has. A child needs to see their face in the core to know they can be in the team. And I go out and I, and they're there. I mean, my God, they're there. I, I've traveled the country. I'm recruiting some tonight. Well, you're you're going to go, right? I'm recruiting people all the time. I'm always recruiting because this is what it's all about. The empowerment of women is the only way we're going to survive this planet. So anyway, so they then become the faces of the core. And they then embedded in the core team after team. I have a program. I, I, so I went out on social networking, and I, we, we have a, a, a community-based STEM program. We'd like to do it here in Boston, wouldn't we, Pete? Need to talk to these people. But anyway, I got a, so I'm down, in, I'm down in Beaumont, Texas. And I went on social networking to the kids in our program, and I says, kids, I'm going to come to Lamar University to give the talk I just gave you. Come. 10,500 middle school children showed up. 10,000 took us an hour and a half to fill the doggone place. The president of Lamar University came and says, Bob, I want to, and he was introducing me. He says, kids, I want you to know that you guys set the all-time attendance record of this arena previously held by Elton John. <laughs> OK. You got it. Uh, yes. <laughs> And they, we buzzed them. I mean, we, this is it. Middle school is the battlefield. They're won or lost by the eighth grade. It's middle school. We have the greatest universities on the planet. Our badge of courage should have the greatest middle schools on the planet. Okay? And that's what I'm trying to do, empowering these teachers to take their kids and blow the tops off of them and immerse them. I love this one. This is in our lab. Uh, this young lady is in our honors program. She's a rising senior in high school. So she's between her junior and senior year in high school. She spends the summer with us. She lives in the dorms. She's assigned a researcher, and then she goes, she was assigned Nicole, and then she goes to see. Undergraduate, undergraduate, graduate student, PhD. Just look down the line. It doesn't take, don't have to say anything. Just look down the line. It's all about taking these young ladies and men and everyone else and involving them to be, this is Katie, who's one of my senior uh, uh, engineers. Katie got her undergraduate degree at MIT, across this town. I met her when she was at MIT. I said, I'm, you're on my team. She went to England, got a master's in archaeology, and then she was a student of mine. And I hooded her a few years ago with her PhD in marine geology and geophysics. Undergraduate geology, master's archaeology, PhD, marine geology and geophysics. She takes no prisoners. So it's all about being able to really take the exciting things we're doing, exploring our own country, finding what we own, but also getting those kids mobilized and excited to do what you got to do, which is study a little hard. So thank you very much.